Uh, well, we've asked Scott to really uh, encourage us and, and also to challenge us uh, this morning with God's Word. And uh, so you'd be praying that God does that as he uh, shares with us from, from, his, from God's Thank Word. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. It is a joy and a privilege to be with you all this morning. Um, as Pastor Rick mentioned, my name is Scott Sward, and my wife Andre and I are friends missionaries to Cambodia, where we've been serving for the last four years. Um, we're, we're presently on home assignment for the next three months until mid-October, when we'll be returning to Cambodia for another two years. And for those of you unfamiliar with Cambodia, um, Cambodia is a small nation in mainland Southeast Asia. It's there in the blue, um, with a population of about 15 million people. It's bordered to the west by Thailand, to the north by the country of Laos, and to the east by Vietnam. And, and Cambodia isn't very large. It's about the size of the state of Missouri. And like its neighbors, uh, Thailand and Laos, the official religion of Cambodia is Buddhism. That means for the majority of Cambodians, all of life is believed to be governed by the law of karma. Everything from one's physical appearance, social status, health, and overall happiness is thought to be the result of good and bad deeds committed in a person's, person's previous lifetimes. Or as the Cambodian proverb goes, do good, receive good, do bad, receive bad. That's karma in a nutshell. But Buddhism doesn't merely shape the worldview of most Cambodians. It's also a core part of their culture and ethnic identity. And this became unavoidably clear to me about a year ago. You see, last June, we, along with our teammates, Fede and Diane Hernandez and their three children, moved to the province of Polsat in central Cambodia. Now, Polsat is the fourth largest province in Cambodia, and it stretches from the border of Thailand in the west uh, over uh, these lush mountains known as the Cardamon Mountains, all the way to the banks of the Tonle Sap, that lake there smack in the middle of the country, which is actually the largest freshwater lake in the whole of Southeast Asia. And of the 400,000 people living in Polsat, less than 1% are Christian. You see, the whole of Cambodia remains unreached, but for those living in outlying provinces like Polsat, um, they have even less access to the gospel. Many have never even heard the name of Jesus. And after moving to Polsat, we and the Hernandezes immediately got busy meeting people. We spent countless hours chatting with neighbors, walking through villages, playing soccer with prison inmates, uh, conversing with Buddhist monks, and drinking uh, coconuts at sidewalk stands. Basically anything we could do in order to build relationships. Well, fortunately, Cambodians are curious and friendly, especially with foreigners, and we had conversations about all sorts of things. The weather, family, politics, and occasionally, religion would come up too. When it did, I was repeatedly told in a polite but firm way that Christianity was not needed in Cambodia. Apparently, nearly everyone was all more than happy with Buddhism. One man put it to me this way. He said, in the United States and Europe, you eat bread. But here in Cambodia, we eat rice. Neither is wrong. Both bread and rice are good for you. Christianity is like bread, he said. Buddhism, on the other hand, is like rice. And no matter what, Cambodians prefer rice. He said, we always will. That's why Cambodians will forever be Buddhists. Now, these conversations got me thinking and praying a lot about my task as a missionary. Is that merely what I'm doing? 
encouraging people to trade in their bowl of rice for a loaf of bread. More than that, what right do I have as an outsider to change someone else's time-honored culture and traditions? As some accuse missionaries of doing, isn't this to act like a sort of spiritual imperialist? That is, someone who uses economic and political advantages in order to impose their view on others. Now, these aren't easy questions, and I wrestled with them for months. But as I did, I kept coming back to the fact that from the beginning, missions has been at the heart of Christianity. And through the centuries, men and women have reminded the church that to forsake our mission to the nations is not only to betray them, but it is also to deny our Lord. In fact, far from imperialism, today churches in Asia, Africa, and Latin America are sending missionaries throughout the world, including to dark, faraway places like Europe and the United States. But again, why? What about Christianity is so inseparably tied to missions? On what basis are we compelled to share Jesus with people from all countries, cultures, and religions, as well as those living just across the street? That's the question I'd like to take up today. Why missions? And in order to do so, I'd invite you to turn with me to Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 20. Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 20. Just by way of introduction, Colossians was originally a letter written by the Apostle Paul to a church in West Asia, a church struggling with questions about religion. Asia is actually the birthplace of all the great world religions, Judaism, Hinduism, Islam, Taoism, Buddhism, and Christianity. And there is a tendency in Asia for new religions to emerge by borrowing and mixing elements of different existing faiths. I'll never forget being in India where I attended a conference. And and during the conference, those of us from out of town were put up in nearby homes. And one evening after dinner, my Indian host, a very polite and intelligent man, uh, took me into his back room. Uh, where he showed me his puja, or prayer altar. And there, on a neatly decorated table, were framed pictures of Shiva, a Hindu god, the Buddha, the Virgin Mary, a favorite Hindu holy man, and Jesus. My Indian host was adamant about his devotion to Jesus. He loved him so much, in fact, that he'd actually added Jesus to the list of those gods to whom he prayed daily. Now, as strange as that might sound, the Colossian Christians were really not much different. You see, they had also added Jesus to their former religion. They'd sort of tacked him on to their previous beliefs and lifestyle. But according to Paul, Jesus plus anything else equals less, not more. And so in his letter to the Colossians, Paul set out to correct an insufficient understanding of Jesus. J.B. Phillips once wrote a little book, uh, titled, Your God is Too Small. 
And if Colossians had a subtitle, it could easily be, Your Jesus is too small. Because throughout Colossians, Paul aims to enlarge and expand our vision of Jesus. And this is most clearly the case in Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 20. Let's look at it together. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he <coughs> excuse me, is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross." Now, Bible scholars nearly all agree that Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 20 is an ancient Christian poem. And like most poems, each word in these six verses is loaded with meaning. Now, we obviously don't have time to examine this passage piece by piece, but I'd like to draw your attention to three parts of this poem. Three parts that I think are especially relevant to our question, why missions? First, notice how it starts. The sun is the image of the invisible God. We see right here that Christianity is not about religion. Instead, it is about revelation. You see, religion is man-made. It is the product of human insight and effort. At its best, religion represents the centuries-long quest for God, harmony, or the absolute. And like all great human achievements, the major religions of the world give expression to profound wisdom beautiful ideals, and ethical seriousness. But the Bible isn't about religion. It's not about our pursuit of God. It's just the opposite, in fact. The Bible is about God's pursuit of us, his stubborn, easily deceived, and hostile children. You see, the Bible isn't a collection of impressive spiritual accomplishments or flashes of religious enlightenment. Rather, the Bible points us to God's own self-revealing, his definitive self-disclosure in Jesus. Now, since moving to Pulsat, I've, uh, one of the things I've done is met regularly with Buddhist monks at a nearby pagoda. And these monks are thoughtful and kind men who have devoted their lives to study, meditation, and to humbly serving their community. And one of the first things they taught me about Buddhism is that despite their reverence for the Buddha, for them he is simply a teacher and a guide. You see, the Buddha claimed to have discovered the truth about reality, or what Buddhists call the Dharma. But the Buddha also insisted that everyone must embark upon this quest for themselves. And this is the basic difference between Jesus and every religion or type of spirituality. 
Throughout history, great religious leaders like the Buddha, Moses, Confucius, and Muhammad spoke of truth. But only Jesus ever dared to say, I am the truth. And whereas many faiths offer us the way to inner peace or eternal life, only Jesus insisted, I am the way. And while there is no shortage of gurus, saints, and best-selling authors who claim to have had visions of the divine, only Jesus said, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. You see, religion is human speculation, but Jesus is God's unique self-revelation. And this distinction, religion versus revelation, is absolutely fundamental for us as Christians. Let's look again at verse 15. The Son is the image of the invisible God. That's what it says. And if we actually believe this, How can we keep it to ourselves? I mean, isn't this something worth sharing? But at the same time, let's be clear. Our message isn't, we're right and you're wrong. Instead, think about it. Hasn't Jesus proven us all wrong? I mean, right from the start, he has refused to comply with our expectations or fit snugly into any of our boxes, including the boxes and expectations of his original disciples. You see, Christianity is not a flawless, inerrant religion. That is not our claim. Rather, Jesus is the flawless inerrant self-expression of God. So why missions? First, because in Jesus, God uniquely revealed himself to the world. But there's more. Throughout Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 20, there's a word that keeps popping up over and over again. Did, you, did any of you catch it? It's the word all or everything. Let's just skim this passage one more time, starting in verse 15. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. Verse 16, for in him all things were created. Skipping down still in verse 16, all things have been created through him and for him. Verse 17, he is before all things, and in him all All things hold together. Verse 18, kind of the last bit of verse 18, starting with so. So that in everything, it's the same word in Greek, panta. So that in everything he might have the supremacy. Verse 19, for God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. Verse 20, and through him to reconcile to himself all things. We see here... That Jesus is not only the unique self-expression of God, he is also the creator, ruler, and redeemer of the whole cosmos. Jesus is both unique and universal. Now, historians across the board acknowledge that one of the most striking things about early Christianity was its speed of growth. Within the first 200 years, despite intense opposition, Christianity spread throughout both the Roman and Persian empires from England all the way to India. But what fueled this underground movement? It certainly wasn't the desire among Christians to provide people with one more religious option 
or to offer an alternative approach to spirituality. Neither, as some recent novels turned movies suggest, was it some cynical attempt to consolidate power. At that time, the majority of Christians were women, children, and slaves. Instead, what compelled them to proclaim Jesus in the face of great danger was the unshakable conviction that what they'd found to be true was not just true for them, but for everyone. You see, these early Christians firmly believed that Jesus laid rightful claim to all people everywhere and that nothing and no one exists beyond the scope of his just and healing authority. In Cambodia, alongside of Buddhism, there's also this deeply held belief in guardian spirits. Now, every place is said to have its own guardian spirit, and those living within the vicinity uh, of that guardian spirit will will make regular offerings of incense, fruit, tea, and alcohol in order to elicit the spirit's protection and goodwill. And here's a picture of a particular guardian spirit. Now, we could compare these guardian spirits sort of to cell phone towers, You see, their power radiates out from a certain location, a shrine, a large tree, a hill, and then it gradually decreases with distance until you enter the realm of another guardian spirit. Now, this might be obvious, but notice what Colossians chapter 1 verses 15 through 20 is making abundantly clear. Jesus is not a guardian spirit. He is not the resident God of a particular place or group of people. He is not even content to just be our personal Lord and Savior. Instead, he is the ruler and redeemer of the whole universe. And this brings me back to the question I asked before. What right do I have as an American to change Cambodians or Cambodian culture? The answer, absolutely none. But Jesus, on the other hand, has every right. The Cambodian people, just like every people, belong to him. He is their true and only real king. And from his heavenly throne, far above all other rulers and authorities, principalities and powers, he is mercifully summoning them and us to repent and believe. Why missions? Because Jesus is unique and universal. But that's not all. Jesus is unique, universal, and he is also of ultimate significance. The details of Colossians 1, verse 15 through 20 are complex, but you see the structure of this poem is actually quite simple. It moves from creation to consummation, from the beginning of everything to its final destiny. Verse 16 looks back to the creation of heaven and earth, while verse 20 looks ahead to the future reconciliation of heaven and earth. You see, this passage isn't only talking about all things It is also talking about all of time, the whole of cosmic history. Leslie Newbegin, one of my uh, favorite authors and a former missionary to India, uh, often shared how on one occasion a highly educated Hindu friend confronted him. And his friend said, 
He said, I can't understand why you missionaries always insist on presenting the Bible to us in India as a book of religion. He said, it is not a book of religion. In any ways, we have plenty of books of religion in India. We don't need any more. Instead, he went on, he said, I find in your Bible a unique interpretation of universal history. The history of the whole creation and the history of the human race. That is unique, he said. There is nothing else in the whole religious literature of the world to put alongside it. And that Hindu scholar was right. From Genesis to Revelation, the Bible presents us with a cosmic drama, stretching to the ends of the earth and the end of time, of which all our individual stories and collective histories are a part. And according to the final words of Colossians chapter 1, verse 20, the central event of history, the defining climax of this overarching story, isn't the rise of civilization or the invention of the Internet. Instead, what is it? Is the cross of Jesus Christ. In other words, this story, this cross-centered story that started with the creation of the world and will conclude with its eventual redemption, includes each one of us. Whether we realize it or not, we're all caught up in this thing. Therefore, the central, the critical question for every person, family, and community of whatever size is this. Are we moving in step with the plot line of history? Or will we eventually find ourselves <laughs> tragically and irreversibly out of sync? That depends on our response to Jesus. He is of ultimate significance. Again, why missions? Because of Jesus. He is unique, universal, and of ultimate significance. Real missions doesn't arise from a sense of religious superiority, pity for the less fortunate, or an ambition to leave our mark on the world. Real missions comes from and is sustained by a large, unrivaled vision and love of the Lord Jesus Christ. And let me just add, if our perception of Jesus ever shrinks or our confidence in his claims gets shaky, will still be able to do lots of really good things. Let me say that again. If our perception of Jesus ever shrinks, or our confidence in his claims gets shaky, we'll still be able to do lots of really good things. Things like feed the hungry, dig wells, advocate for justice, engage in interfaith dialogue, live in community, even meet weekly for worship. Now, obviously, all of these things are extremely important, and as Christians, we need to do them. But if our understanding of Jesus gets small or fuzzy, while we might keep on doing these things, we will abandon missions. And sadly, Many mainline Protestant churches in the United States are a perfect example of this. You see, missions is like a three-legged stool. It is based upon a triple commitment to the uniqueness, the universality, 
and the ultimate significance of Jesus. If any one of those beliefs gets wobbly, our mission efforts will inevitably collapse. You see, missions is proof as to what we really think and feel about Jesus. Robert Speer, one of the great mission leaders of the late 19th and early 20th century, put it like this. He said, if Christ means nothing to us, we shall surely not go to the trouble of taking him to the world. He went on. He said, the mission, missionary enterprise in this light is the surest evidence of the esteem in which Christ is held. And the church that is doing nothing to extend knowledge of him to the world is furnishing sufficient proof that Christ means little to it. Therefore, he said, the fundamental question in connection with missions is this. The fundamental question in connection with missions is this. Is Christ of any worth? Is Jesus of any worth? worth? That's the question Paul was addressing in Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 20. It's the question Andrea and I have had to repeatedly face in Cambodia. And it's a question for you. Is Jesus Christ of any worth? Our commitment to missions is a good indication of what we actually believe in terms of that question. And very briefly, by commitment to missions, we're not just talking about your prayers and your money. As important and helpful as those things are, and for which those of us in Cambodia are extremely grateful. Instead, I think the best gauge of a church's commitment to missions is their kids. That is, are a significant number of the young people who have grown up in this church expecting that God may call them to forsake the comfort and privileges of life here in order to be a missionary? And, equally as important, do the parents in this church share that expectation? You see, when it comes to missions, our children are where the rubber really hits the road. So why missions? For one reason. One main reason. Because Jesus is worthy. He is unique, universal, and of ultimate significance. Jesus Christ is worthy. Do we really believe that? Do I? Do you? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, you are worthy. You are unique. You are the flawless image of the invisible God. There is none like you. You are universal. All authority in heaven and on earth is yours. And you, Lord, are of ultimate significance. You will come again at the end of history to judge the living and the dead. Lord, may our words and our deeds, our lives and if necessary, even our death, testify to your greatness, your glory, 
and your inexhaustible worth. May you, Lord, the Lamb who was slain in order to purchase members of every tribe, language, people, and nation, receive the reward of your sufferings. For you alone, O Lord, are worthy.